Okay, welcome to the security introduction, first lesson. So, um, what are we going to do today? I will tell you a little bit about the planning of subjects and guest lectures, maybe. Uh, <coughs> we'll see. Um, then we will give a very broad overview of what security means. And um, I can already tell you that, um, apart from learning a lot of the basic jargon that is common in security, um, you will notice that um, for some reason there seems to be only here it starts talking about computer security. That's because security as a field of expertise is much broader than just computer security. And many of the um, technical things have either variants or uh, the exact same thing might apply in the real world. So when you're making notes, try to include in your notes that um, a lot of the stuff that um, is in the slides, a lot of the stuff we talk about has real world, uh, physical world alternatives or similar issues. So you start working towards an overall view of security and not just the specific field of computer security. Okay, then there will be computer security part and we have a small assignment with a small presentation. Um, that's pretty much it for today, as I uh, no, uh, mentioned. There's a lot of learning goals. Um, I strongly recommend that you use these as a, a study guide. So when you're preparing for the test, just use these learning goals. Um, there is an estimated study time, of course, included. We do this with all our lectures, as you saw yesterday. So <coughs> it's a good overview of what you should prepare for. Okay, so the course overview. Um, several of these lessons will include a practical assignment at the end. Um, uh, I, I did ask most of the guest lecturers also uh, agreed to do this, to have a practical component to most of the stuff we're going to experiment with, uh, learn about, and so on. So, for instance, uh, the PK, PKI, SSL, there will be quite a lot of practical work as well. So you can work around, uh, play around with some things and see how things work under the hood. Um, Therefore, it is crucial that you have a laptop. Are there people here who do not have a laptop? With them? Okay, perfect. So, uh, it's not really necessary for today, don't worry, but uh, you will need it. It's, it's uh, helpful to make notes, but you will need a proper laptop to do much of the uh, practical work later on, because it becomes quite technical and you will need to install some software in some cases and so on. So this introductory course, like I said, it doesn't have an assignment, a complete extensive assignment that will take the entirety of the time that has been reserved for this course today. But there will be a simple research task and, so, and a small presentation you will be asked to give. Um, there will be many guest lectures. Um, you might have noticed this. Uh, keep an eye on the site. Um, as well, we talked about this a little bit before. Uh, it's a small world, but there's a high demand for people in this field of forensics and security. So uh, it can occur that there will be some small, small or maybe large changes to the planning, also in security, of when guest lectures are given. So keep a close eye on it so you don't miss anything. And most importantly, there is a, uh, a requirement to be present at the security courses for this reason as well. Information from the guest lectures will it can and will be included in the test. So make sure you take notes and make sure you're there for the guest lectures. This is really important and I, uh, this is, I want to stress this very much uh, because it's, it's, of course, yeah, well, I, did, I, I had to work or something at, during that time. I'm sorry, um, this is a full-time study and you were supposed to be there and take notes. So either make preparations or make sure you're there. Okay. Oh, and of course, like I said, we will try to record all of them, but we can't guarantee that for everything. Okay, security. So what what in the world is security? There are, um, if you Google security, you will find sooner rather than later the term CIA. This has nothing to do with the Central Intelligence Agency in the US. But if you Google CIA, you will find those guys. Um, it's a very common abbreviation. It stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And there are some additional fields determined and defined called authenticity, privacy, and you will see authentication, authorization. Um, 
And as you probably can see, like I mentioned before, these principles, they don't state anything about computers or IT. And if you start thinking of real world examples of these six basic principles, <coughs> more or less, you can think of examples that have nothing to do with computers here. For instance, let us, let's assume we have building security. A good example of building security, let's for instance uh, assume there's a guard sitting at a desk and you need a, some kind of a key to come in and then the guard checks you and he checks your pass. And you're covering, for instance, some of these things already. There's no computer involved at all during this. Confidentiality. Let's say we are we're talking about personnel files. There's a good chance that um, the stuff contained in your personnel file, and in my personnel file, there's private privacy sensitive information. My address, my phone number, my uh, burger service number, my, uh, which is the uh, social security number in the, the US. That's stuff that's pretty much confidential and it might even be privacy sensitive. It actually is. So once again, this is, it might just be a physical file in a drawer somewhere, but it still applies these kind of these basic principles. <coughs> There's passports, passports. Um, well, modern passports also contain uh, digital information, but of course, a passport still contains some very sensitive information. So, um, <coughs> what do these fields mean? Well, confidentiality is basically about uh, <coughs> knowing that uh, in Dutch it's called vertrouwelijkheid. It means that you have, uh, it's related to privacy therefore, for instance, um, that uh, you can compare this for instance to a document that has a big stamp on it that says top secret. So you can say, if, if confidentiality is in order in security, that the document will only be viewed by people who you trust or are trusted to review this document, or are, should be the ones reading. So, <coughs> integrity is about, um, think of this, for, you can think of this, for instance, from a uh, computer standpoint, by thinking about the integri integrity of data. And in the broadest sense, this means that, um, maybe once again, we're talking about a personnel file. If you open a personnel file, you know that the information contained in this personnel file is correct. It is correct in the sense that the information, uh, for instance, with the personnel file, it is the correct address. Uh, there, has no, uh, there has been no tampering with this information in the document and so on. So you can imagine that this is very important for digital security as well. You know how easy it is to modify data on computer systems. So integrity is very important. Availability, you can compare this to uh, who's worked here in the supermarket by any chance. Okay. Um, availability, if you're familiar with the supermarket, you're probably familiar with these, uh, these safes they have in supermarkets. So what, what's common for these supermarket safes is that they only open and close at given times to prevent people from coming in after hours and breaking in and then emptying the safe, for instance. So availability has to do with that in the sense that availability means that the information for safe, this is not the information, actual money, perhaps, is that the information is available at the time it is intended to be, and not outside these times. So this is a very important principle as well. Okay, and if you start thinking about these additional areas, you can probably understand what authenticity means, and why privacy gets involved. Privacy is, a, there actually a can also say for privacy there's a more or less a definition that says uh, it, it, it makes sure that you are in control of who can view your data or not that's a good definition of privacy for instance it means you are the one owning the data at all times and you can decide okay you can view it when and when I choose you can view it so this is this has to do with availability confidentiality again so you can see where these overlaps are so authentication and authorization, um, well, maybe the simplest example is this, the card I have here. It, it serves both as authentication and because it also contains authorizational information, that is to say which of the rooms in this university I have access to, 
That's also covered by this. But this also has to do with, <coughs> you can also rearrange this. But as you can see, the, the, there are very, um, and for most of these things, you can probably uh, think of, of multiple non-technical examples where these fields also apply. OK, so um, the difference between security and forensics. Um, these two fields are unmistakably connected. And many of the principles that apply to forensics apply to security and vice versa. If you're doing forensics, it's very important that you think about integrity. Some of you already uh, started uh, talking about hashing and so on yesterday. This has to do with integrity. So you can see that there's a lot of overlap. And the fields are principally connected in, in the sense that security is about mostly about prevention, mitigation, and detection. We'll see more about that later on. But forensics is very much so, oh dear, it's gone wrong. And hopefully, we had our prevention, or security, mitigation, and detection in order, so we can find out what went wrong exactly. So forensics is mostly after the fact, after the, something has gone wrong, in that sense. So once again, I would like to invite you, if you have any anecdotes, questions, remarks, share them. There's some very interesting examples. OK, so we're going to look at computer security in particular. Of course, we're in IT studies. So that's our main interest. And um, the problem with security, much like forensics, is that it's extremely multidisciplinary and very technical. It doesn't need to be. In fact, some of the most entertaining stuff can be non-technical, just creative use of devices or whatever, or, or applying them in an interesting way to break security or not, or prevent things. Um, oh, there's an interesting typo. Um, security incidents, however, despite us talking about computer security, often have a completely non-technical cause, security problems, incidents. And why is that? Because there is one thing you can never really solve from a security point of view, and that's us as people. Uh, in, in the very basic sense, this is um, faith in other people. If you, um, let, let me ask you, how many of you, if you would approach your mother or father and ask them for their password, how many of you would think they would give it to you if you just asked them? Just raise your hand. They would most likely give you their password. But now consider this from a security point of view. This is actually a bit odd that they would just do this. If you think about it, they might use this. Just imagine what you could do with it. So it could be something as simple as that. Or it could uh, be we leave our office door open. And when we come back, because we also forgot to lock our laptop, to the desk, with one of those nice Kensington locks or whatever, <coughs> um, it's gone. We trusted no one to walk in and just smash and grab or <coughs> take it with them, and it's gone. <coughs> and for 99 out of the, maybe even more, for 999 <coughs> out of a thousand times, this goes well. But if it's the one student or the one incident where someone from the outside walks in and thinks, hey, that's a nice laptop, it's gone. <coughs> Here, check this side out. Any, anyone have any idea what I mean with that? Here, check this side out. It's in quotes. Mm -hmm. Email from a friend. Yeah. The uh, commonly known as phishing mails, which uh, as the, which is the official term, more or less, these days. Uh, you get a nice email, it seems to be from a friend. And they say, here, click this, uh, click this link, uh, there's a funny picture of you. Or That's a very basic example, but you see the more uh, complex and very tricky ones with all the banking uh, stuff. It's very interesting, of course. And they try and trick you into either installing uh, malicious software or you, sometimes you don't even notice it because you might be vulnerable to things without <coughs> knowing it, and so on. But it seems to be a legitimate email from someone you are inclined to trust, so you click on the link. That's where the problems start. So there's a... Um, <coughs> this person here on the right, it's, it's Kevin Mitnick. Um, he's very famous. He was um, um, 
in, in some respects he might be a bit overrated, but he was very good in one particular thing in security, also in computer security, and that was social engineering. And um, he, gives, he, he went to jail in the end over this. Um, some of the things he did were a bit gray or even black hat, but that's a different story. But the thing is, um, he realized that you could use this to, um, once you have a, uh, a security breach in this sense, once you trick someone into trusting you, you can use this effectively to, you have a wedge, the first crack. You need to think of this as a chain. That's why we're so, sometimes it's called the chain of security. And a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So if you s somehow manage to get access to some part uh, of an organization, of whatever, where you're not supposed to be getting access to, you can start, usually you start working your way into digging even deeper, uh, seeing where else you can get into. <coughs> so, <coughs> What's a simple example? Well, let's for instance say um, if you say if you walk into an organization um, and you say, "Well, I'm here to meet this and this person." Beforehand, you uh, saw this, uh, <coughs> and you see them. You sit down, you wait, and then you see some people walk through one of these uh, doors that have a lock, and then you say, "You say, hold on," and you see if you can just walk with them. And you've already effectively bypassed part of the organization. You just you manage to talk your way inside, and then you start accessing other rooms, basically because the people who do have access are inclined to trust you already. Well, he, he's already inside, so he must be an employee. So you can see how you can effectively exploit this kind of trust to work your way around an organization. <coughs> and Kevin Mitnick was very good at this. Um, <coughs> A particular example was that he, um, uh, at one point he was uh, in Las Vegas and one of the things he noticed was that there was an engineer working in uh, one of these uh, phone switches, phone relay stations. So um, it, it's these houses, you see them, KPN has them, uh, they, they are everywhere, uh, where all the phone traffic is being rerouted, redirected and so on. This was actually quite a while ago. So he started chatting up this engineer, the door was open, he was talking to them, oh it looks interesting. and. Uh, so we looked inside to see, uh, I was chatting to him and the engineer, well, he thought, well, with a nice guy, I actually have some talking, uh, a, a nice chat with someone instead of just being alone here in this relay station and talking, just a small house. And one of the things Kevin Mitnick did was he was started looking around and one of the things he noticed was that there was a small modem standing there, just a simple uh, device for uh, uh, communication. And the phone actually had a phone number sticker on it. So he remembered this phone number, and when he was done chatting, he went home and he dialed this number. And lo and behold, he got the modem on the other line. So he set up a connection, and he got a basically a login window. So he was like, well, let's see what happens. He just entered, entered nothing, and he got full access. And it turned out to be that the modem was controlling the relay station. In other words, it was, the, uh, it was designed to be a a device that would allow these people in the central IT departments uh, to control this relay station from a distance. Well, you can imagine <coughs> how dangerous this was. Because this meant that as an outsider, there was no checking, no password, no anything, because he knew this phone number, he was able to basically control the all the telephony traffic that went to this relay station. Well, you can probably imagine why this gave people in Las Vegas quite a scare, because what happens in Vegas, <laughs> so all the calls that were also being rerouted and redirected and so on, was casino calls and so on. So you can see why <coughs> Kevin Mitnick was very creative. He found out <coughs> different ways of uh, uh, traveling for free and so on. And many hackers um, do this. They don't, don't, do, don't do this for... Uh, bad things, but they do this as part of, it's called penetration testing, pen testing. And it's, well, you can probably imagine, it's almost impossible, well, it's practically impossible to prevent. Um, no matter how good your security is, you always need to assume that somehow someone can be manipulated in some way um, to give you an opening into the organization. And, <coughs> well, it says, 
well, the solution might seem simple. Well, you just need to train everyone. But can you imagine having to train, in, in the simple example I gave you, imagine having to train your mother so she knows exactly what to do, so she is uh, to the level of an IT security expert, so she exactly knows what to say, when, under what circumstances, mind what. And now imagine doing that with an organization of maybe a thousand people to the same level. It's completely impractical. The only real solution you can have is defense in depth, but we'll get into that later. And a noticeable thing, um, not a, sorry, uh, one thing of note is the WikiLeaks example. Um, are you all familiar with WikiLeaks? WikiLeaks, for in some ways, relies on this, <coughs> either convincing people or um, people who um, think that some information should come to light somehow manage to access this <coughs> where they shouldn't have. Uh, and then they give it to WikiLeaks so they can anonymous, anonymously spread this information. What's the most recent example of this? Snowden, Snowden exactly. Uh, maybe he saw the light, or how you wa however you want to call it, and he decided to see how far he could get into the organization, into the information contained within the NSA, and decided to collect this and then hand it over. He didn't do it anonymously, of course we know who he is now, but that's what an organization like WikiLeaks, for instance, relies on, to some extent. <coughs> so, <coughs> as you can probably imagine, this is new, all these techniques. In fact, uh, Mitnick was arrested, I think, in the early 90s or late 80s or something. I'm not sure. Um, these kinds of uh, security incidents and uh, noticeably computer security in incidents, um, they've been going on for a while, but there was a big wake-up call that made everyone realize that it was becoming an urgent problem to take care of this in, an, in a structural way. And mostly this was uh, due to the, well, basically the arrival of the internet and the explosion, the commoditization, so ev which means everyone was able to afford computers, for the first time, um, it became very obvious that this was starting to pose a risk. Because if everyone is connected and everyone has a computer, it means if you find some way of abusing this technology, you can, the, the, the amount of people you can influence or the amount of information you can access or whatever your intent is becomes quite big. And um, the, uh, a good example of this was the Morris worm. This is Robert Morris. He was the, uh, if I remember correctly, he was the son of a university teacher uh, in one of the American universities. And as part of his, uh, uh, he was a student, and as part of his work, he was looking at uh, bugs in software, just nothing special. And what he um, thought of was, why don't I try and write a piece of, uh, basically a virus, you know, that is somehow capable of using all these different kinds of security bugs to spread itself around. And for the first time, he also thought, well, this was an 88, so connectivity, computers were getting connected. Let's see if I can write it in such a way that it uses all these bugs and all this networking software. Um, so it is capable of doing that on its own. I just need to start it up. It will actively start looking for other machines to infect and so on. And I'm, I'm, you might not have had this realization when I just said it, but this is still what's going on. If you think about botnets and all the recent problems, this is still how it works. It, it's quite a prevalent problem still. So he decided to write this software, and um, well, you might think, well, okay, everyone noticed this and started to uh, just use a, an antivirus scanner, and then the problem was solved. No, uh, unfortunately not, because this is 1988. So... <laughs> There wasn't any antivirus software uh, that was capable of detecting this. And uh, unfortunately, uh, well, he's still a programmer. He also made a mistake. And his software didn't actually correct, correctly determine if one of the systems it tried to access was already infected. And then it affected it again. So you can probably imagine what happened. Um, most of the internet at that time, I want you to realize what this 10% infection rate means came to a screeching halt because his software, at one point it reached some kind of critical mass, his virus, 
And the only thing all these systems were doing was running his virus, eating up all the resources. They estimate that more or less 10% of these systems then on the internet were infected by this. Now imagine that in this day and age, 10% of the internet would get infected by a virus. It will also come to a halt pretty much, but you can imagine the impact it had even then. Um, I think he was let off, uh, let off uh, when it came to jail time in the end, but he did have to pay quite a hefty fine for this. Um, but they had uh, a lot of difficulties even convicting him. There wasn't even any law covering this kind of things. But you can see um, this was a pretty much a wake-up call. We need to start thinking about these kinds of security problems and how to take care of them. So one of the things that happened was um, they started setting up certs, C-certs. Uh, it stands for Computer Emergency Response Teams or Computer Security Incident Response Teams. And um, surf search, some, some of you might have heard of this. Um, and there's also gov search, which is now a part of the NCSC in Holland. And these are organizations that are mostly tasked with prevention where possible, detection, uh, sometimes even uh, advisory roles when it comes to the NCSC, and doing forensics of these incidents. So uh, a lot of the work, I, I, I do part of this work as well as a uh, CERT worker for the HVA for our network is looking at trends. What kind of odd traffic do we see? So if there's suddenly a spike in a certain kind of traffic, why is that? So you need to, it's trend watching, uh, just a lot of reading up on the latest things that might be going on. And it also, uh, one of the things that uh, also arrived at this time was, well, we need to start making sure that we can um, pretty much do safe communications to begin with and prove who we are, uh, that we are who we say we are. Um, so certificate authorities do this kind of work. That's the whole certificate stuff. And I see people laughing, probably about the Diginotar example. It brings, indeed, it is funny, but it does bring its own problems. But we'll get into it later. So I mentioned these things already. So computer security is for a large part unlike forensics, about prevention. Many different types of access control, usually. And why do you do this? Because um, prevention is so very important because if one part of your um, system fails and someone manages to break in, and I don't need to give a specific example, you want to have defense in depth, it's a term, so defense in depth, D-E-P-T-H, because you want to prevent the spread further. You should never trust that a, a person or a break-in is just going to be concentrated on the part that was broken in. Any decent hacker, especially in this day and age, will see how much further he or she can reach or break in. So prevention in multiple layers, at, at, at multiple layers, in multiple layers, uh, in, of your systems is very, very important. And that's all fine and dandy, but you need detection of this as well. You can have the best prevention in the world, but if you're unable to detect the actual break-in, what good is your prevention in the end? You basically need to trust that nothing ever goes wrong and that your prevention is perfect. And what did we just learn about prevention? There is no perfect prevention. So you need that. Very good detection systems. And why, finally, mitigation is an important point. If you did your prevention properly, OK, you have detection. That's all fine. But if all the information <coughs> was concentrated, for instance, on one system, and only had one layer of prevention, for instance, and this is, uh, for instance, uh, very privacy sensitive data, well, sorry, that's the end. Everything is still open and wide, accessible by the hacker in this case. So you want to have systems in place and policies in place that whenever such an incident occurs, the impact is as small as possible on the organization. Most importantly, the primary process of the organization should not be affected, or the core business, or whatever you want to call it in business terms. So what does this mean for our university, for example? 
if, let's say, uh, one of your uh, virtual machines is breached, we do not want this to affect the operation of all the other machines in the VMware cluster. So we have all kinds of prevention and detection from that point on between the systems and, and so forth and so on. So you need to have this defense in depth. You have, need to have all these, uh, well, all these different parts of good security very well implemented. You have, need to have very good policies of what to do when and so on. <coughs> okay. And uh, one important realization is that um, do realize that many of these incidents that you will see if you start working in security, they commonly have a local cause. The root cause, that is not to say that not people from the outside can then just abuse this leak or hack or something as well, but incidents often have a local cause or come from the population, your user population. Um, the Morris room, like I said, this was a student that worked at the university. He already had access to this system, which he used as his initial infection ground, and from there it spread. If someone doesn't keep their uh, university PC up to date, they constantly decide not to do it because it's annoying and they don't want to reboot, and their PC gets hacked and turned into part of a botnet, it is still a local cause. It was the user consciously making or being, maybe being able to make the wrong decision about what to do with their system. So you can probably imagine what this means for you coming over here with your laptop. You're, co you're all coming over here with your private equipment, bring your own device, it's uh, called in marketing terms, which is perfect and I love it as well that I can do that, take all my equipment from home. But you can imagine that the university has very a complex prevention, detection, and mitigation things in place to isolate a system that comes to this network and completely misbehaves. Because maybe without the user even knowing, you wouldn't believe how many people walk around with infected laptops without realizing it. Maybe not in this population because you're all IT savvy, so you would probably notice this sooner or later. But imagine on the entire student population of about 50,000 students. And they need to have this, these kinds of mechanisms and policies in place. <coughs> OK. So um, digital crime. <coughs> A lot of the um, digital crime comes from these security incidents. And with security incidents, I don't mean the actual breach has happened yet. but Problems within your network where your security is failing and you don't know it yet. So it's actually already an incident, but you haven't realized it. So digital crime that comes from it, and it's usually where the um, suspects, the perpetrators, the bad guys, they are out to require some kind of resources, some kind of return on investment. Um, they, sp they spend their own resource, resources and time on this with also a resource actually, but and they want to be rewarded, preferably more than they invest. It's just business, basic business. And usually this guy, this is something like uh, maybe they want processor processor time. I don't know. More examples on that later. For calculating things, or maybe just using that system that they infected as a ground for more attacks. If they manage to, if they're super secure secure network and they manage to infect one of the machines, they can use that as a uh, a launching site to see what else they can affect in the network, for instance. Identity theft. This is actually more common than you might imagine. Um, uh, there's actually very directed and targeted attacks at systems like the student information system we have. Or uh, there's not, I, I'm not going to name any specific example or do I know of any, but this happens all over the world. The, the hacker state perfectly understand what kind of systems they need to access that contain all this identity sensitive, this privacy sensitive information. This is why you read about credit card hacks. These systems that contain this kind of information usually contain enough information, full profile information of users, to start faking uh, credit cards, to start uh, ordering stuff online for free and so on. I, basically the, the idea of identity theft. Money, just plain money, extortion. 
these um, uh, these criminal networks they if they find if they realize that they can extort people and this happens also quite commonly is that they they will start they will what they will bluntly do they will call the company or they will mail this company and they will say either you pay us maybe seven thousand euros or whatever before um, maybe in two, two weeks time or we make sure your entire network is online and then the company is usually uh, they can go to the police and the police can do their best but you can imagine how many companies just pay up this money and why do they do that because the cost of completely having to shut down your operations if your internet is based in some way or internet dependent in some way is quite quickly goes above this five to seven thousand dollars or whatever euros. And this is exceedingly common, unfortunately. And they have many different ways of doing that. Or voice over IP, also a popular target. They will just infect the, uh, well, this is uh, usually these systems that do these uh, uh, modern telephony. If you pick up, a, a, even here at the university, we have these systems and you pick up and it's all done over the internet. But if you manage to somehow, uh, infect these servers and you manage to reroute all the calls through a nice uh, uh, shady uh, corporate uh, company thingy in the Bahamas, the phone costs for the university would suddenly skyrocket. <coughs> so this is also what happens. And it can be quite an unfortunate surprise if you get the phone bill at the end of the month. And this happens a lot to companies as well. It's a popular target. And sometimes just plain honor and respect. This is, um, um, <coughs> I don't know how common that is, but uh, uh, there are also a lot of hackers who have these, que these questionable morals, as it were, who do black hat, gray hat things, and they don't do it because they are interested in financial gain or anything like that. They just want to impress others, and they want to be realized, well, look at how cool I am that I'm able to do this. So <coughs> that's all, 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 mm. These are all um, reasons for these people to cause secure incidents, perpetrate crimes, and so on. Most importantly, and I touched on this subject uh, yesterday as well, digital crime is not the same as hacking. I used to, I also interchanged the terms, but hacking is about changing the behavior of a system to something that wasn't originally envisioned by the manufacturer or designer. Um, and the media gets this wrong all the time. They always talk about hackers, and they usually mean that uh, in the uh, bad sense. Someone only does, is a hacker if he's doing bad things. But hacking is much more than that, <coughs> actually. Um, OK. So, and hacking, therefore, is also not illegal, <coughs> the term. And within the security community, people talk about hacking in a positive, it has a positive connotation, unlike cracking. So developing new software is hacking. Think about the definition I just gave. Developing new software is doing new things with a system that weren't, probably weren't originally envisioned by the manufacturer. And the, the simplest example of this is back in the 60s when these mainframes first started appearing at universities. What the researchers did that worked on these systems was they started messing around with them. What else can we do other than this accounting software or these very simple calculations? And they started making computer games. There are examples of very, very old systems, and, and, and with old I mean uh, which use vacuum tubes and relays instead of transistors even, that were used to play um, well, Botocas and Aire. You're familiar with that game. Or Otello, or uh, very simple games that were easy to program. And that's all hacking. It's a difficult area um, because sometimes you are in the gray area, um, and sometimes there are laws preventing or set have some somewhat stating what you can or cannot do. For instance, if you start tinkering with, um, if you find a way to tinker with your car to change its performance characteristics and so on, is that desirable? Would you want to do that? Most of the insurance companies will have something to say about that, so you get into gray areas. Okay, maybe for your own car, makes sense. In some countries, this is a lot. But what if you find out a way to do this remotely? Think with other people's cars. Um, the thing is that the um, 
computer science is much quicker than law can ever be. Law is generally about at least about five years behind the times because it takes quite a bit before a law gets crafted, discussed, passed, and so on, and implemented, or, or jurisprudence on something. So um, when it comes to the, um, the hot new developments in IT, particularly in security, it is mostly the security experts, the, um, the well-known the experts um, and recognized as such by the security community that um, it's an ongoing discussion, therefore, but they determine what the situation is, what is acceptable, <coughs> what isn't. You can do pretty, even if you're doing a pen test, for instance, if you're hired to do a pen test, um, you need to make, therefore, very strict agreements with the company you're doing it on where do you stop. If the company says, literally, in writing, you would want to have this, but let's, for instance, say you can do anything you want and you manage to crash their entire operations, stop their core business, you're going to be glad you had that paper signed by them that said you could do anything you want. Even though you might have broken the law, the company explicitly agreed to you doing that. But should you still be prosecuted then? It's, it's not always that clear cut. Um, the general terms for, these, for, the, for this draw, uh, you have to draw the line somewhere. The general uh, agreement is that you draw the line between hackers and crackers. The white hat and the black hat. And in, in the broadest sense, the white hat and black hat comes from uh, Westerns, by the way, um, where the good guys always have the white hats and the, bla the bad guys have the black hats. Um, that's pretty much how it works with security as well. The white hats are the good guys. They do things to Im improve everything for everyone. And the black hats, they do it uh, from selfish motives or several of the other possible motives I listed. And you have the gray hats um, that are somewhere in between. It's not always that black and white, as I said. There's also uh, one noticeable group that's called the uh, script kiddies. It's a subgroup of the crackers who don't know what they're doing. They just know how to download a tool and click on a button, mostly. Um, but they break stuff, and they think it's funny or cool, or they do it to impress other script kiddies. Um, but they're at the bottom of the food chain, basically. But they are a big problem because it's um, script kiddies will still be able, even in uh, these um, modern times, it's still not that hard for script kiddies to do some of these very nasty things. Even though they're not experts, they are still able to bring down networks and so on. Okay, so um, luckily some things are specifically illegal by law. Much of this is in the telecommunications uh, law in the, uh, in the Dutch law books, you can actually um, look it up online. And don't be scared by all the legalese that's contained in these uh, books of law, because it's actually not that hard to read. It's more modern, so it's much less difficult, actually. Um, denial of service, or distributed denial of service, that's uh, particularly this one is a massive problem, even to this day. What you do is you make systems, or networks, therefore, as well, you make them completely unreachable, preferably, by either doing sending so much traffic that way or such a mass of attacks that no legal or, or desirable traffic uh, gets through anymore. You're just drowning out everything else. Or you find some way of uh, just sending one sp specific piece of information that crashes something and makes it unavailable. That's also possible. It's less common, luckily, because uh, it's di di more difficult to find, but it can also be Problem. So you can probably imagine that <coughs> these criminal networks that extort these companies, they use methods like this. They will say, we will kick you, basically kick you off the internet by just flooding your entire connection. You will not be reachable unless you pay them. Um, there's, of course, computer, 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 Albert. in Dutch law, it's called um, breaking into and or causing damage to systems. Um, of course, this is why you, uh, why I mentioned this pen testing, you sign an agreement with the company because uh, this is basically what you're doing. And in order not to be prosecuted or having the guarantee that you're not going to be prosecuted, you do this. Um, this implies, of course, that you're doing it without permission. Breaking privacy laws, there are uh, luckily also very strict laws in the Netherlands about uh, 
the protection of privacy sensitive information. In Germany, they're even stricter, actually. Uh, theft of resources is illegal. Um, this is um, also a, an increasing problem. What, they, uh, what a lot of these networks now do is that they will um, not only use your system to do one of these things, they will install software, malicious software, that allows them to do any of these things as they wish. Um, a, good a good example of this is um, a lot of recent malware also has support for Bitcoin mining. They will just use your leftover processing power to make money, even though when they're not using those systems for other nefarious purposes. Um, they might even do something like this. They install software that allows them to break encryption. Distributed. Um, there's a legal use of storage just for hosting uh, very uh, nasty or otherwise undesirable information. So this is a quite a problem. Um, interestingly, this, this, all this law stuff, like I mentioned, is not even that old. Um, oddly enough, um, uh, this might surprise you, but does, does anyone have any idea how computer criminals used to be convicted <coughs> before this law was in place? They were um, being convicted under laws that governed the use of electricity, for instance. They were being um, convicted by uh, on the, on the on the grounds of using illegal use of electricity. <laughs> so this actually um, so if if someone uh, was using resources somewhere else, and of course if you use a computer more, it uses more power. You all know this. Uh, if it's doing hard work, it draws more power. So they would get convicted under these kinds of laws. Oddly enough. So that was, of course, not a really work continuously. Uh, it, it didn't work in the end, so they needed to craft special laws about this. So now it's different, but you see, it, it's, it's not that easy. And sometimes they need to be creative with the law as well. Um, <coughs> hacking um, isn't easy <coughs> in multiple respects, but, and that's why it's in bold, software is full of errors. No matter how th secure you think your system is, <coughs> there will be uh, tons of errors in it, believe me. I think the, uh, one of the most, um, I think the, uh, NASA gave an example of uh, the uh, source code they had in the shuttle, which is now decommissioned, unfortunately. But, um, and I think uh, even NASA still said that after, a while, I think that's been, things been in surface for 30 years or something, 40 years. Uh, even then, they, after all these revisions they did, they still knew that there were at least, even in this very small amount of code, because you can imagine how old the computer equipment is in the shovel, they still knew that there were about four to ten errors. They just couldn't find them. But they knew it because sometimes the shuttle systems would do something that wasn't supposed to happen. They knew how to solve it, work around or restart or whatever the problem, but they knew there were bugs. They just couldn't find them. So you can, even after so many years, even after there will always be bugs. And there's been a lot of research on this. And it doesn't matter if you work for as a, uh, in a commercial setting, if you're a freelance developer, if you're an open source developer, and you do it for fun programming. On average, all programmers make the same amount of mistakes, as it turns out. There's been quite a lot of research to support that. And this can lead to interesting problems. And hopefully this works. I don't know if you're familiar with this, this old one. This was the Ariane rocket. Uh, it doesn't work, actually. It's not, let's see. Let's see if I can put it on the secondary screen. That's better. A software error can uh, cause this as well. <coughs> this was not a mechanical failure this launching of the satellite, this was a simple programming error. 
and it was really, uh, but simple, I mean really simple to the level of um, the previous type of rocket they used, used a different kind of processor and stuff. You can read all about this. And when this new type of rocket, they wanted to launch it, they forgot that they needed to make some changes to make it work properly on this new kind of rocket, this new kind of processor and so on. And this, I can, you can probably imagine that this was not a cheap mistake <laughs> that they made. <laughs> so the impact can vary very much. <laughs> And there's, uh, uh, if you want to read up on this, you can read uh, the Wikipedia art article. It was a painful mistake, but it was, in the end, it was just a simple software mistake that they made. Um, you can also uh, do interesting things with these bugs. Uh, I don't know who owns here, and, uh, who owns an Android phone or an iPhone here. I guess most of you, who here has uh, installed their own software, has rooted it. Many hands go up. The fact that you can do that is because the programmers, they don't want you to do this. So they make, they prevent you from doing this, usually, when they can. Especially Apple doesn't want you to do that to their iPhones. But Apple developers also make mistakes. And depending on the mistake they make and the seriousness of it, it allows you to access it. Okay. Um, some important considerations. The open source mentality, because this is very directly related to the field of security. Is that of the white hat hacker? Um, I am not particularly opposed to commercial software. It has its uses. We all know Windows and so on. Um, but I do believe that open source is a better choice. And not necessarily because I believe that everything should be free, but because open source allows everyone to look at what the system is doing, to determine what a system is doing, and most importantly, depending on the license, everyone can improve it, contribute to it. That also means that, by definition, you can pretty much state that an open source system, given the same amount of developers and users and so on, open source will always be safer for this reason. Because if as what is the theoretical amount of people that could look at Linux, which is an open source operating system, the entire population of the world? And what is the maximum amount of people that could look at the Windows source code? That's actually quite a small group of people. So you can imagine that more eyes generally means uh, the, that the quality of the software goes up, given, like I said, the same constraints and so on, the same context. Um, and the main advocate, and he's very, very uh, black and white about this, in fact, is Richard Stallman. He founded the Free Software Foundation. It's, uh, as an organization, it stands for everything must be free, uh, open source, open license, and so on. Um, they not only came up with several licensing forms, but they also <coughs> did develop their own software. And this was born out of the uh, idea that um, at the time when they were founded, uh, systems were moving towards closed source including uh, many of the software that was being used on these systems moved towards cloud source and they wanted to make sure everyone could still keep communicating with each other and you didn't have to, you, you didn't get stuck in a vendor lock-in as it's called. The techniques and technology you knew about could be applied to other systems. So that's in very gen uh, general terms. Like I said, Linux is the most famous example, pretty much. It's a complete operating system. And Linus Thorvalds, who came up with the, uh, the concept, the first versions and so on, and he's still the, uh, uh, the great leader of Linux, he, right from the start, he decided for Linux to be open source and open license. <coughs> and please note that also WikiLeaks believes this, but they do this from a different point of view. They believe that not only software and so on, they think that all information should be free and publicly accessible. So everyone can look at what's going on. So that's, it's not that really that different, that mentality of freedom of information in the broadest sense, whether it's a computer program or something else. <coughs> Does that mean you can't make money if it's free? Nonsense. There's a lot of companies using open license, open source software or developing their own, and they make tons of money mostly on support services, 
or integration or you might not be able to charge money for the software itself but that doesn't mean you can't charge so anything for all the services related to it. IBM, Red Hat, Ubuntu, Google is pretty much built on open source software, open license software. They have some very specific things that are very much only useful for Google actually that are closed source that they developed in-house but most of their platform runs completely on open source and open license stuff and uh, I didn't I, I don't know what's uh, what Google's recent stock prices are but they're not bad as far as I know and they make a lot of money with this and uh, somehow uh, sometimes they do this by profiling particularly Google is very good at this they collect everything they can about you and they sell it and use it for marketing this can be pretty invasive sometimes. Um, who here has a Facebook account? <laughs> be honest, who has a Facebook account? <laughs> who doesn't is the question. Um, I do not envy you, but I don't have a Facebook account, particularly because Facebook is extremely invasive. I already have my doubts about LinkedIn, which I do have, but Facebook is a, bit, is a step too far in my book and I also do not want to have Google Plus and all this stuff because Google already has some information that I unfortunately don't have a better solution for but I would gladly dump Google for as well if I could. This is what, how these companies uh, make money. They use it for commercials, advertising. Um, hackers also do this <coughs> either uh, with their hacker group or uh, alone. If they specifically start profiling people for some kind of gain or whatever it's called doxing. It's a more recent term. But that, that's what it's about. You can also make money with that. <coughs> so what do you do with, as a security? What do these white hat people do? If you're one of the good guys, if you find these bugs, generally you choose one of these three when you find some kind of security issue. And, and like I said, this can be physical, this can be digital, it doesn't matter. Um, ideally, you want to go for this one, number one, full disclosure. Which is, I, you put all your cards on the table, you be, it's, like I said, freedom of information. Anyone can read this, and there's, uh, there's uh, lots of mechanisms for this, for varying from websites to mailing lists to where you can announce this. You found a bug, you sometimes even deliver a proof of concept, if it's appropriate, and you show there's a bug in this piece of software, in the case of a digital bug, digital issue. Um, this is how you could abuse it, this is the impact, and so on. There are standards for all this. And if you want to look at it, you can, there's a, a link. Uh, you can, but you can probably imagine if you do this with a product that is in widespread use, in, for instance, in systems that might contain, uh, usually contain very sensitive data, it might not be in your best interest in a hacker to do that. It's going to ruffle some feathers, it's going to ruffle some jimmies, and it's going to upset some <coughs> people. So you can choose to do limited disclosure. Uh, usually this uh, means that you approach the company or organization or developer or whatever and you give them all the information you have just to them and you give them a chance to fix it. Um, unfortunately, um, in an ideal world this means the company says thank you and they fix it and they release an update. In practice it is not that uncommon if you do this that either the company uh, tries to have you arrested because they think you're breaking our shit and we're upset about this and wah 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 or they don't respond at all and the bug is still there and as a hacker you need to assume that if you found this bug somehow that there's a good chance that other people are going to find it as well who are and if they're if you're lucky another white hat is going to find it and he's going to get a result but you need to assume the worst Someone with bad intent is going to find it and do something bad with it. So usually if you don't get a response or you get the wrong response, at some point you decide, maybe anonymously, to still do full disclosure. Well, there's also a responsible disclosure um, where you find some kind of uh, uh, agreement with the company. You can probably imagine what this is. Then you say, well, we found a bug, this and this. We will not publish it, but you, here is the fix. Of course, this is not ideal because anyone who is interested can still look at the differences between the two pieces of software and pretty much reverse engineer what was wrong. 
with the original, and then it's still on the streets, but you have some kind of odd um, mixed forms of disclosure as well. If you're a white hat, of course, if you can find this stuff, you can earn money. You're usually employed, <coughs> um, often by companies that uh, are, are their main market is in finding, uh, disclosing, uh, fixing stuff, or doing pen tests, for instance, such as Fox IT, ITSEC, Hoffman, any of these, to find and solve the security issues. Um, usually, it ends up with full disclosure, or at some point, or uh, any form of disclosure. Um, commonly, I, I'm sure you're all familiar with Microsoft's past Tuesday. What Microsoft does is they have their own, they're big enough to have their own staff looking into this stuff. And, and their own uh, offices for doing security research. So all they do is they do uh, responsible disclosure. They list, well, this was uh, fixed. They don't show proof of concept and so on, just that they fixed some kind of problem with this part of Windows or whatever. And uh, here's the patch for it. And the only, uh, as you might have noticed, if you follow this kind of information, only in very rare circumstances, they release a patch outside of their normal cycle. They only do that if someone fi outside of Microsoft <coughs> finds a bug that is of such a critical uh, uh, importance that it needs fixing straight away. Okay. Um, well, like I said, you're usually in demand. So if you don't mind breaking stuff you're not supposed to and breaking the law, you're going to be employed as well, but by criminal networks. And. I would strongly advise against that because criminals are not nice, not even if they're other hackers. Uh, but um, what they do is non-disclosure. They and, and it's got it's gotten to the point of that where criminal networks they will offer so much money that hackers will be tempted by this and work for them. In fact, many hackers, bad hackers, are in service of criminal networks. And as it turns out, when companies fix bugs, such as when Microsoft fixes bug in Windows. These uh, criminal networks, they have all these very good hackers in, in their employment, and they have at least seven other exploits just waiting. They just take the next one off the shelf, and they start using that bug. And then they wait until Microsoft fixes that one, and they take the next one. They just have a, a whole bag of other tricks that they will just take the next <coughs> one out of. And that's the reality of the uh, situation. And this is, this is why I keep re reiterating the importance of defense in death. You need to assume that something is broken, and you need to have this uh, layered defense. So, conclusions, therefore. Um, computer security concerns all hardware and software you can think of. And to a large extent, with hardware and software, I also mean this and people. It's also about uh, securing people in that sense. So you need to assume everything is buggy, broken, and dangerous. No matter how good you think your systems are, you will be vulnerable to something. Just think about Stuxnet, Iranian centrifuges used for nuclear enrichment. You might think, well, those are, aren't even connected. If you somehow manage to manipulate people into uh, taking USB keys, uh, that's presumably how it spread, and then infecting the systems that are supposed to be closed off and so on, you will always find an in. If you try hard enough, you will always find a way into an organization. And you might think, well, OK, but Iran was doing bad things. To give you an idea, it was recently also made public that one of the nuclear reactors, which was, thank God, not even active and de being decommissioned in South Korea, it turned out that many of their internal systems were infected with malware. And I don't need to stress the uh, seriousness of a nuclear power station being infected with something like that. So there is always a way in if you look hard enough. You also need to assume everyone is buggy, broken, and dangerous. And I will have an example of that later on, what I mean with that. You can only try and mitigate. And the only proper way of doing mitigation is if you have a good security policy. Carla will tell you a lot about this during her guest lecture on information security. Because security is not about um, looking at a computer screen, setting up 15 firewalls, like uh, the CSI uh, type 
series and so on. Oh, they've broken through five layers of our defense. Ooh. Wow. It's like the, uh, the oil tanker with 41 hulls. Oh, if it only hadn't hit 42 rocks. But, uh, you know, this, this is nonsense. This, it, it's about defense and that means having an integral policy, an integral security, and integral security me measures at all levels of your organization, systems, and so on. So it's very complex and it's very difficult to do properly. And even then, if you think you've got it all figured out, there's always a way to break in. Um, so here's an example of what I mean with that. Uh, from Randall Monroe, one of my favorite uh, comic writers. Um, you might think, well, I will just encrypt everything and nobody can read my data. There's a simple solution to that. The CIA will just abduct you and torture you until you give your password. It's basically what it says here. Beat him with a $5 wrench until he gives you the password. It's, it's, there's always multiple angles of attack when you want to hack something. Is the idea. Um, okay, so <coughs> that's on security. We'll have a short break.